Thank you, Lou, for uh, leaving us in that good singing. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate each and every one of you. And I do need to make one other uh, announcement of folks in need of our prayers. Uh, Franklin and Brown passed away yesterday. That's Judy's husband. Judy, former member here and been taking care of her husband for a good while. And he passed away. We do not know arrangements, but uh, uh, Junior Cheryl and uh, Martha Lumpkin are knowledgeable of Franklin Brown's passing. And I know we've had a lot of folks mentioned on the announcements, and I, I was thinking some would say too many announcements. Uh, but we, it's sort of like the guitar figure I heard one time stopped everything and said, we need to tune up. We, we tune because we care. And we have announcements about a lot of folks because we care about them. So uh, just bear with us when we have to do that. We do care. We're glad you're here. Next Sunday is going to be a very uh, special time. Next Saturday and Sunday for our family. The Sigmar congregation we worked with 31 years in two periods of time. And uh, they have invited me to come back and preach next Sunday morning. They're having a open house. They've just uh, had a big addition to their building, a family life center, and we're going to be doing tours on Saturday afternoon. And then a lot of activities. Our family's been invited to sing, and uh, we're going to have a meal and all that. So it'll be a very nice Saturday. And then on Sunday, they've asked me to preach. So we're ex excited about that opportunity and um, thankful for it. And thank you for your prayers and concern and thank you we try to do for the Lord's cause. Thank you very much. Well, we want to continue our conquest of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, hopefully we're going to make it by Bible Bowl. We're getting close anyway. Uh, we're ready for chapter 13 this morning. 13. As we look at some of the great spiritual lessons from the Gospel of Luke. In the 13th chapter, Jesus observed some discussion going on by some of the disciples. It was current news about a tire and Salome fell and killed 18 people, and they were all talking about that. And um, there were some Galileans who were offering their sacrifices, and Pontius Pilate sent in some soldiers and shed their blood in their offering of sacrifices to God. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of people upset about it. Uh, the Romans ruled the world, but they were not, uh, and they were very powerful uh, observers of wanting their way to be done about everything. So Jesus makes a point, as everybody's talking about the Galileans and talking about the tower falling on 18 people, just happened to be in the area where that tower was, and it fell and crushed 18 of them to death. And they were talking about it. He said, do you, do you think, you know, that that doesn't affect you and the way you live? Repent or perish. We all need to be willing to repent of wrongs in our lives. And they're not more wicked or more sinful than you are. That's the point. You think you're, they're more sinful than you are because <laughs> the tire fell on them? Because the pilots shed their blood? No, I tell you nay. But except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. So I think there's a spiritual lesson. We often uh, want to pass the buck or we often want to um, blame everybody else for situations that exist in our life. But we need to make sure that we repent when we need to repent and get things right before the good Lord above. Also in chapter 13, the question is raised in verses 22 through 25. A man listening to the Lord teach said, um, are there few that shall be saved? And Jesus said, The inner ye in is the straight gate, because straight is the gate, and there is the way that leads to life, and few that be defined. Yes, yes. You've asked me, is there going to be few people saved? Yes, because most people want to walk that broad way that leads to destruction. They're not willing to walk the straight and narrow that leads to eternal life. So uh, uh, the challenging situation is, are we of the few? It's all right if you're a Marine and you're one of the few and proud and all that, but we don't want to be one of the few that we want to be one of the few that make it to heaven, make it through that straight gate, I'll get it right here in a minute, that leads to eternal life, not the wrong way that leads to destruction. Also in chapter 13, a very tender moment is when the Lord observes the people and of Jerusalem. 
And as he observes and looks down upon the city from Mount um, Gethsemane, Mount of Olives, you can view the city of Jerusalem. And he's in that place, location. And he tenderly says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killeth them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thee together as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings? And you would not. The Lord wants His people to come to Him, to follow Him, to listen to Him. Some did, some did not. Chapter 14 has the great illustration about being invited to the feast. We had a sermon on this not too long ago. All things are ready to come to the feast. The wise, rich man who had the feast prepared wants everyone to come. But immediately some began to make excuses. The one who bought ground, he'd go look at it. And the one who um, was just got married, and he couldn't, he had to spend the time with his wife. The other one had five yoga boxes. How many yoga boxes? Five. Good Bible question. And uh, so they're all out of order there in regard to the invitation. You don't buy land and then go see it. You don't buy oxen and then go through them. And if anybody needs a good meal, it's a newly married man. So the point is, the Lord said this man gave the invitations out and nobody's coming. He said, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. There's a spiritual lesson. We need to make efforts. We need to think souls. We need to try to get our own families here and get others that we can reach and have an influence upon and contact by Bible studies, by invitations, by sincere concern for their souls. Think souls. Jesus did, and he included it in this great story of come, all things are ready. Come to the feast. Also in Luke 14, there is some difficult teaching from Jesus about following him. He said if any man would follow him, let him, he cannot follow him unless he hates his mother and his father, his brothers and his sisters. Now, you immediately read that from the King James Version, and you think, what? The Lord wants me to hate my mother? No, the King James Version uses the poor word to communicate love less than. To love less than. We are to love the Lord first, seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. That's the right, proper relationship by which the Lord expects us to serve Him. We need to love Him and do His will. Above our own personal will, our own personal egos, we put first the kingdom of God. First, the Lord Jesus. That's what He's meaning in Luke chapter 14. Chapter 15. Perhaps the most repeated of Jesus' teachings is in Luke chapter 15. A story that's gone around the world known by many and loved and appreciated and it's a message to all mankind the prodigal son the elder brother this all came about according to Luke 15 because Jesus was eating with sinners and the scribes and the Pharisees didn't want him to eat with sinners didn't think that he should and that's what motivated this great parable that a certain man had two sons. One was younger and asked for his inheritance. He wanted to go out and live accordingly. And he did. And he wasted on righteous living. He became hungry when he lost all these good time friends. And he decided he'd go home and tell his father that he was worthy to be called a son anymore. But when the father saw him coming, and he did, because he was out there looking every evening, I'm sure. And he ran to meet him and embraced him. My son that was dead is alive. My son that was lost is found. And he rejoiced that he was able to be home. Get a kill the fatty cat, put a ring on his finger, put clothes on his back. He's home. Now the other the elder brother represented the Pharisees. The younger brother of the prodigal represented the people of this world who didn't make a change. And he made a change. I, I'm no, worthy, no longer worthy to be called my son. Just maybe not one of your hired servants, Father. But no, the Father was willing to accept him and embrace him. The elder brother represented the scribes and the Pharisees. And he gets angry. He's approaching the house and he hears the music. 
and the dancing. And he says to one of the servants, what, what's going on here? And uh, the servant said, well, your brother's home, and your father's killed the fattened calf. The well, older brother doesn't have a good attitude about this at all. And he gets angry, and the father comes out and entreats him, begs him, don't be this way, come on in. Rejoice that your brother is found, he was dead, he's alive. But he says, well, I've served you all these years. You never prepared a feast like that for my friends. And, and he's, woe is me. He can't rejoice when his brothers come home. But the father says, this is something we couldn't help but do because your brother is home again. We don't know how that story ended. We hope that the elder brother came on inside and bear hugged his little brother and said, I'm glad you're home. But I doubt it because the Pharisees and scribes are so self-righteous, so hypocritical, so in love with themselves, I doubt they could ever humble themselves enough to welcome the prodigals back into the kingdom of God. Sad. Are we the same way? Do we have lines by which we have drawn against people because of the color of their skin, because of their status in life, because of situations that we create within our own reasoning? We mark them, we separate ourselves from them, and will not receive them into the kingdom. What's different between us and the elder brother when we have such feeble attitudes? Nothing. So we need to change. Chapter 16 has the most powerful story in, in the whole Bible. The most touching one, I think, imaginable. Luke 16, beginning of verse 19. <clears throat> there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain poor beggar named Lazarus laid his gate full of sores, and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. More with the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, was carried away with the angels at Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, the King James, the King James uses hell, the Greek word is Hades, the abode of the dead, where our loved ones go to, Two compartments, torment and paradise. And in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And he said, Father Abraham, a far off. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus, let him dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. He said, Son, remember. Thou in thy lifetime receivest thou thy good things and Lazarus evil. Now therefore he is torn, he is covered, and thou art tormented. Besides all this, there is between us and you a great gulf fix that cannot be crossed. Neither can they come to us that we come from thence, neither can they come to you from thence. He said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. How many brothers? Five. Good Bible question. I've got five brothers at home, lest they also come to this place of torment. Father Abraham said, Son, they've got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Nay, but Father Abraham, if one arose from the dead, they will repent. If they will not repent at the preaching and teaching of Moses and the prophets, neither would they be persuaded that one arose from the dead. True. The Lord knew the truth. But what a picture. What a powerful, moving picture. Two men live and two men die. And the, the difference in their destiny that could never be changed. This great gulf cannot be crossed. Can't swing across it, can't swim across it, can't climb across it. Once we've died, our destiny is eternally sealed. Pray to God that we're on the right side. Can you imagine just longing for a drop of water from the tip of a finger? How much water can you carry on the tip of a finger? But he would have given comfort comfort that he's never obtained. I pray to God it's not describing us someday standing before our eternal abode craving for a drop of water. The rich man in Lazarus. What a powerful, powerful story <coughs> should warn us of our eternal destiny. That was chapter 16. Chapter 17, Peter raises the question, Lord, if our brother does us wrong, how many times should we forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus answered, said, not till seven times, but 70 times seven. That's 490 times in a day. An exaggerated point, but a good one. 
an exaggerated point. There's hopefully could never be a situation 490 times on the same day somebody would do you wrong. I'd be out of there and gone if that situation prevailed very much. And I think all of us would. But it's the principle behind it. How often should my brother sit against me and I forgive him? Seven times. And he was thought to have been generous when he, and that's a good Bible question too, seven. Uh, he thought he was being very generous because the, the old teaching of the old um, rabbi leaders was um, three, three times. But he's doubled it and had one for uh, good, and one for good, you know. Oh, seven times? No, no, 70 times seven. Be willing to forgive. Don't hold up, hold ill will and harbor that in your heart and go against those who need forgiveness. The 17th chapter also, and had a good reading a moment ago, the 17th chapter has the text of the ten lepers. A moving story. Jesus healed them all, but only one came back. That penetrating question. Where are the nine? Doesn't that shake you? Are we one of the nine sometimes? Taking everything the good Lord's given, how much do we appreciate His goodness and His kindness? I told the Bible class I'd run over there this morning driving and talking to the Lord. And I was thinking about how this virus has raised its ugly head again. And I was thinking, have we... Did, did we thank God enough during those days that we were so happy that the vaccines here this is conquered, everything's going to be good and, and great and healing and the old virus, you're cold, you're gone, buddy. The old virus COVID said, no, I'm not. I'm still around. I'm still healthy and I'm still alive. And so we have the challenge before us. Did we thank God? How many prayers were we just Oh, this is wonderful. This is great. These doctors have really done tremendous. Or how much more we praise God that He has worked through these situations. And we need His help again. We need His help to more than we ever had before. So, are we the nine? Where are the nine? Are we the one who came back? I hope we would be the one who would come back and say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's look at one more chapter. Chapter 18. Chapter 18, Jesus taught that we ought to pray not to faint. Verse 1 says, not to faint means to give up. You need to keep on praying. That's what we need to do about all things. Just keep on praying. Persistence. Not giving up. And he told an illustration. There was a woman brought a matter before a judge. And this judge is tough. He didn't care about what people thought. He didn't care about what God thought. But this woman just kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on. And finally, he granted her request because he was tired of her bringing this before him. Do we tire God with our request? Not literally, but we can sure impress God by our requests and our prayers that we believe God can change things. There's power in prayer. There's prayer that changes things in our lives, the power of it with God's help. We don't ever need to take for granted. This widow's request was granted because she, she wouldn't give up. We need to have that kind of determination and faith in our prayer life. In chapter 18, also, as the Pharisee and the publican, the two that went to pray, and when they, Pharisee just thanked God he was not like others, that old publican over there, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I have. But the humble publican would not so much as lift his head up, but he just smote his breast and said, God, could you be merciful to me, a sinner? That's the prayer we need to pray, brother. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That humbleness, that attitude will take us a long way before the courts of heaven. This self-righteousness and a uh, vain <clears throat> an attitude that the Pharisee represents, trusting in himself that he were righteous and that he were better and he were greater. Wrong. We need that humble attitude of the publican. God be merciful to me, a sinner. 
Amen. Amen. If there's one here today that's been touched by some of this great gospel of Luke that we tried to share with you some lessons about, it would be our hope and prayer you would respond right now. The Lord's invitation, believing, repenting, confessing your faith, being baptized in your Lord for the remission of sins, or being restored to the Lord if you've fallen away. While there's time and opportunity, brother and sister, we need to do something. The rich man in Lazarus, the Pharisee and the publican, the rich farmer, all these great stories from Luke are have within them a message. Be rich toward God. Be found faithful unto Him. That is the great challenge of all. If we can assist you, we can honor to do that right now while we stand in the